Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tony Hale. I'm the Director of Environmental Informatics here at SFEI. I'm going to be the moderator today for this webinar about the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas, a new report co-developed by SFEI and SPUR. Before I turn it over to our presenters, I would like to take a minute to set some general ground rules for today's webinar. First of all, we are so happy that you're, you're here, uh, but there are a lot of you. So to make this effective, we're going to have all audience members on mute for the duration of the webinar. You'll still be able to ask written questions through the chat function uh, for, for the Join Me application. We ask that you, po that you pose them at any time and direct them to me, the moderator. My name in the system is Moderator. The presentation will last about 30 to 35 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Julie Beagle is SFEI's Deputy Program Director of the Resilient Landscapes Program and a lead scientist for the organization's climate adaptation efforts. Laura Tam is the Sustainable Development Policy Director for SPUR, leading their work on water, energy, climate change, and resilience. They are the lead authors of the Adaptation Atlas. So, welcome Julie and Laura. Hello, thank you all so much for being here. We are so excited to present to you the culmination of our work over the last three years, this Adaptation Atlas, which we hope will be a step forward for our region in tackling this complex challenge of sea level rise. This has been a unique and productive bridge building partnership between SFEI and SPUR, bringing together experience of ecology and geomorphology of the Bay with SPUR's thinking about land use considerations and policy connections that arise with climate change planning. And it has also been the product of many, many advisors and collaborations between our state and regional agencies, nonprofits, science experts, and many, many more. Before we get started, we would like to thank our generous funder, the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, for supporting this work and their leadership in this area. And we're also really grateful to some other funding that we received from the Spitzer Trust, the Marin Community Foundation, the Seed Fund, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Natural Capital Project, and Google. So we're all here today because we know that sea level rise is happening. But even a few years ago, this used to be something that was going to happen way in the future. As we work on this issue, these projections get higher and creep closer and closer to us, shortening the time that we have decision, that we have to make decisions and act. So we're spending time as localities and as a region assessing our vulnerabilities to sea level rise, what areas are going to flood and when, and this is so critical. Oh my God. But even a few years ago, this used to be something that was going to happen in the future. Adapting to sea level rise will require changes to the shoreline, big changes. So then the question becomes pretty quickly, what should we do about it? How do we organize ourselves to adapt and how do we make sure we don't leave our children with a bay that's lined with concrete walls? How these changes collectively adapt the shoreline will determine the fate, the fate and health of the bay. So we think that a science-based framework is really essential to identify a, effective adaptation strategies that are appropriate for their particular setting and that take advantage of natural processes in the bay. So we think this project starts to help fill that gap. We developed the Adaptation Atlas as a way to turn the corner to try to turn the conversation towards the question, how do we adapt our San Francisco Bay shoreline using nature-based strategies, and what's the scale at which that needs to happen? These are really tough questions, because we all know that in this urbanized estuary, the bay and the shoreline are heterogeneous and dynamic. For example, in some places we see steep shorelines like this, lined with railroad tracks. In other places, we have broad, flat, subsided baylands buffering the bay. Here, we see the juxtaposition of housing built on former baylands to then our completely built out San Francisco shoreline. So it's intuitive that given this physical diversity, there's no one size fits all for sea level rise adaptation. So we start from the understanding that this bay sits at the intersection of a watershed drain, 40% of California, the forces of the Pacific Ocean, 
And the processes where these two meet, the tides, the waves, the wind, and the sediment transport within the estuary. These are large driving physical processes that govern the shoreline and happen at the base scale, which are often too large and too complex for individual projects. This is made much more complicated by our over 100 cities, nine counties, special districts, regulatory jurisdictions, inequality that crisscrosses the area around our shoreline. But we know that if each property owner, each city goes it alone, we'll end up with a piecemeal approach to shoreline adaptation that will not be responsive to or take advantage of the processes like the movement of sediment and water, waves, and tides. Sea level rise will not stop at city boundaries, so we need to figure out ways to work together. We see the importance of that already with major roads such as Highway 37 flooded for weeks at a time that crisscrosses three counties across a vulnerable wave-built berm connecting people to work, hospitals, other critical services. So the Adaptation Atlas aims to address this challenge by proposing to divide up the bay into manageable units, a new planning unit that respond to the physical and ecological processes that are driving the bay. We then map the suitability of several nature-based adaptation measures and integrate integrate across our normally siloed land water divide, connecting bayside strategies with land side measures. And we do this in three steps. Plan using nature's boundaries. Step two, identifying measures that work well in a given place that then we think could be used when bringing stakeholders together to envision a resilient future. So these are tools towards some planning process. So what do we mean by nature's boundaries? We also call them, lovingly, Operational Landscape Units, or OLUs. These are 30 unique segments that we propose are areas with shared geophysical and land use characteristics that may be particularly suited to a particular suite of, of nature-based measures. We can't or we shouldn't do everything everywhere, so how do we draw some boundaries that respond to the way our bay was formed? We want to put the right kind of strategy in the right place that will work. We don't want to invest in solutions that don't solve for a lot of benefits and won't last very long anyway. So we think this scale is bigger than our individual projects at which we normally work, bigger than our cities, but maybe smaller than counties, and could potentially provide a blueprint for how we can work together. Who needs to be in the room? Communities, residents, governments, agencies, scientists, advocates, many more, so that we can work with nature to protect our shorelines. So we'll tell you a little bit about how we define these units. And it starts with the most basic physical setting of our bay, which runs along the axis of a down-drop trough between two major fault systems. And from there, we define three major geomorphic types of landscapes that are dependent on the relationships of that land, of the land to that trough. So first, we characterize headlands and small valleys. You know these landscapes. You drive through them. You see them from drones. By the way, the headlands that jut out into deep water, as seen here in Marin. Other examples include much of the Contra Costa shoreline, where steep slopes and deeper water set the stage for a particular suite of strategies that are different from, say, areas where alluvial fans push perpendicular into the bay, and the influences of large watersheds have built up sediment over time, creating a sloping descent toward the bay. You can see these. Palmate features in our surface, the surficial geology of our region, but you can also see them in the way that we've developed the landscape. Older residential land uses tend, tended to be on higher, well-drained alluvial soils, and light industry developed last in the former seasonal wetlands and wet meadows at the distal edges of those fans. Finally, wide valleys along the axes of the fault, such as Santa Clara, Napa, Sonoma, Petaluma, Here's a look down Santa Clara Valley, which historically had wide expanses of wetlands. We see this mirrored in the Napa Sonoma Baylands, although land use patterns have varied very differently between the North and the South Bay, as you know. So the basimetry also varies dramatically. And combined with this other information sets the appropriateness of different strategies, whether the shoreline drops off into deep water or whether there's enough room for oysters and eelgrass, marsh restoration, other types of, of nature-based strategies. So our area of analysis was fairly large. We took the H++ scenario from our newest OPC guidelines. We added a buffer to that. And to differentiate between OLUs, we followed drainage divides, tidal sheds, and sewer sheds. 
So while OLUs are defined by their geomorphic unit, those geomorphic units and bathymetry, we characterize them by physical and ecological factors, patterns of the built environment, and key vulnerabilities. So these are data sets that are made by scientists throughout the region that highlight the differences in tidal range, wind wave heights under different conditions, and how we've changed and managed the shoreline. What the balance used to look like, how we've modified them, how we're restoring them, and what that means for the elevation of the, of the baylands. Laura here, thanks Julie. We also know that people live and work in this urbanized estuary. So how we choose to adapt could affect the built environment at the same time the built environment and modifications we make to it in the next few decades can help us to adapt. So we wanted to characterize oil use based on where people live and where they work. You can see that we have a lot more job density within oil use than housing density right close to the shoreline. And in some ways, this is a good thing because commercial uses can be a little more flexible in their location while some commercial uses can and in their future than people and homes. And in some ways, we are better off than other urbanized estuaries around the world because there are quite a few OLUs where there's room at the shoreline to advance nature-based measures. While this is not a vulnerability study, uh, th that's being done by our partners at BCDC and at the city and county levels, these are important characteristics of OLUs which help us to understand where we need to make plans first or bring people together by OLU. Infrastructure needs special care because many infrastructural assets that we have have a design life and some of these things, roads, wastewater treatment plants, and other things will be redesigned or rebuilt in the next 10 to 30 years and again in the future. That gives us an opportunity to consider sea level rise over the life of the asset and design for resilience and to perhaps relocate or realign infrastructure for future readiness. So that was step one. Moving towards step two, this is about identifying adaptation measures that work well in a given place using nature as much as you can. In thinking through selecting adaptation measures for a given place or OLU, what you're vulnerable to depends on where you are. And there are many types of vulnerabilities to sea level rise and flooding. For example, there is overtopping of berms. This is a typical bay levee. This one is in Hayward. Everything is low lying, not necessarily well maintained. And during a storm, levees like this can be overtopped. Some places have more of a, a vulnerability to combined flooding from creeks. Combined flooding refers to when you have creek flooding and high tide flooding at the same time, making it hard to push water out into the bay from channels. So here you see Alhambra Creek and downtown Martinez. We had a similar situation in Coyote Creek in San Jose in 2017, where you had a lot of, uh, of flooding that was hard to get out. There's also king tide flooding on sunny days that will get more and more frequent as sea levels rise. So our work is really about finding out the source of that vulnerability and pairing it with measures that could do a certain job. For example, when wave overtopping or erosion, as you saw, is the flood risk um, of the flood risk levy is caused by large waves. An example might be a marsh or a beach or another wave dampening option in that place. If your vulnerability is from subsided areas behind levees, caused by the diking and draining of marshes, options can include reconnecting creeks to subsided areas. Um, so this is not rocket science, it's thinking about where the vulnerability is, what's the source of it, and what's the type of nature-based measure that could best address that problem. So we want to stop for just a moment and make sure we're really explicit about why we're focusing on nature-based adaptation, with the acknowledgement that there needs to be green, gray, and hybrid approaches throughout. It's becoming more and more widely understood now that nature-based measures have multiple benefits, including flood risk management, but also wildlife support, recreation, carbon sequestration, and, and we're finding more and more information about the, the cost becomes less and they are more adaptable over time. And as a region, we've agreed on this. Through the Bail and Goals update, where we as a scientific and management and conservation community agreed on target acreages for maintaining marshes in the face of sea level rise. And through the work of many of you here today, we've made major progress towards that goal. But we need to continue and we need to do more. And there are other important types of nature-based adaptation that are possible. For example, the San Francisco Bay had 
27 miles of estuarine beaches in the 1800s. And these aren't kind of put up your umbrella and sun-based beaches. These are coarse-grained, steeper slope shell beaches um, that knock down waves and slow erosion and also provide important habitats. We have one example of a beach creation at Aramburu Island and several more in the works by Marin County. We have really innovative living shoreline projects such as oyster reefs and eelgrass. And these photos are of the living shorelines project at Giant Marsh that the Coastal Conservancy and partners put in the ground this week. And other land shaping strategies like the Oraloma Horizontal Levee. So we started with a list of nature-based measures and policy, regulatory, and financial tools, and took a first cut at identifying their suitability within the OLUs. So of course this is not a complete list. There's many more options. And we look forward to continuing this work over time and continuing to build out this data set. So for each measure, we have mapped a spatial suitability for each intervention, but also how big, how wide, how high in the tidal frame does a particular feature need to be to do a certain job, like knock down waves. We also describe other ecosystem functions they provide, what coastal risks they can help mitigate, and policy considerations that we need to think about when implementing these types of measures. So in order to map the suitability of these measures, we needed to start with an understanding of elevations across the bay, in the baylands and beyond, and how those vary with respect to the tides, which we know vary around the bay considerably. So from this analysis, we look at relative elevations of the baylands, and we can pull out areas that are suitable for certain types of adaptation strategies. Essentially, which areas are lower and which areas are higher normalized across the bay and the tremendous variability that we see. So I'll give a couple examples of this. To map the suitability of marsh restoration, we identified areas that are at the right elevations today to potentially support tidal marshes. And then we assess the width of the marsh needed to knock down an 100-year wave to one foot, just as a minimum width, which is, which is a minimum buffer. And as a region, I, we mostly have a good handle on where these opportunities are. But moving upslope, we identified areas that are currently too high to be tidal marsh today, but that will be within tidal range in the future and could be really important opportunities for wetlands to migrate as seas rise. And when we, looked at these er when we looked at whether these areas are currently protected or not, many of them are and many of them aren't. And so in our urbanized area, these opportunities are few and far between. Where they do exist, where unprotected areas at the right tidal elevation exist, we need to really carefully consider that if we act now, we could allow for more accommodation to sea level rise in the future. So, here are some examples of many of the measures that we looked at across the entire bay. And as you can see, and as you already know, not everything can go everywhere. So we roll up those data at the OLU scale, seen running from top to bottom in the middle of the screen. And then we rank the suitability of each measure by the relative proportion of that area within a given OLU to give each a suitability score. Now, this is not meant only as guidance. It's not a mandate but we really hope it can provide a first cut for communities and, and land managers to consider a filtered down range of opportunities that may be more likely to succeed in their area. So we also wanted to think about over time as sea levels rise, there may be a future where water crosses over the levee or the horizontal levee or the ecotone levee. So in order to understand what some of the tools are that we need to adapt our, our inhabited places. We um, wanted to ask, what is the landscape like on the dry side of the OLU, currently dry side or occasionally inundated side? What are the land uses and, and how do people inhabit places that may be potentially inundated? And then what is the menu of available policy, financial, and regulatory measures to adjust buildings, to adjust land use, to be ready for the future when seas are higher than they are now, especially in those areas where we have less room to work with nature-based strategies. As you know intuitively as well, some places have room to modify the shoreline between where people live and work, and even room around buildings that presents an opportunity. And that land-water divide looks different in different places. Some places have not much room to move or adjust land use that much. Still other places where there's connected infrastructure can be harder still. 
but this can also be an opportunity to add in or support natural solutions while rebuilding the road or rail line in a different way, perhaps elevated to a causeway or just raised up on a levee. In order to think about how land uses and intensity and density uh, vary across OLUs, we developed an index called place types, which are a proxy for different types of uses of land. We've characterized 14 different types and uh, they, they take into account uh, five different factors, the density of intersections, permeability of the landscapes, the density of housing and jobs, and a measure of how mixed the land uses are. And this en enabled us to, just like you can recognize steep headlands and wide alluvial valleys, you can, care, you can see that these types of patterns from being in them and from living in them, driving around them, or simply using Google Earth. So we wanted to be able to understand how much of each type of these landscapes are at risk of future flooding in OLUs, and what would we do about them um, now that we have the foresight to know that sea level rise is happening. There are a variety of, in the adaptation strategies section of the atlas, there is a fairly rich description of each of these types of measures as well, um, in addition to the nature-based measures. Although we're, we're not as easily able to say, to match them on a basis of elevation to place, these are gonna be more of a choice over time. And so that's why we'll get to this, but in the process that we recommend for doing adaptation planning by OLU, understanding these options, the relative suitability of these options will be part of a planning process that people will have to use to figure out which of them is most appropriate for them. In order to figure out and make some suggestions, though, we convened a big group of landscape architects and engineers and urban designers to sort of vet suitable flood control strategies by place type, and then we use this information to suggest policy and planning measures for specific OLUs based on their land use mix, based on their place types, and thinking through the sequence of place types in a transect from the shoreline going landwards. So then, this all comes together in what we're calling an opportunity map seen here. We want to stress, like Laura was saying, that this is a toolkit. It's not a restoration plan. It's just filtering down the range of suitable options. And the goal is to use this um, in, in a planning process. So here's an example. Um, the Napa Sonoma OLU, not surprisingly, is an area with many subsided valens, which will need continued restoration um, in, in conjunction with the restoration that's already going on. And there's also critical opportunities here for acquiring marsh mi migration space um, and, and continuing to reconnect creeks to the Baylands. And here's also a good example of a place where elevating roadways is important. And I'm thinking of, we're thinking of Highway 37 here, as well as perhaps on the policy tools side, things like conservation easements or strategic voluntary buyouts to enable land use transitions. So this looks really different in the East Bay, and so we think this is a good example showing a places where beaches, oysters, eelgrass may be better suited because of the different landscape setting. This OLU has a lot of adaptation options available to it, and it also has a lot of complexity. There are many landowners, many tenants, many business owners here relative to some other OLUs. So raising revenue to pay for adaptation through such finance, financing mechanisms as a geologic hazard abatement district or other types of business improvement districts could help pool resources to pay for infrastructural investments. Here also is an opportunity for highways 580 and 80 to be elevated to a levee to provide upland flood protection. So a final example for this presentation is the Richardson Bay OLU. And again, each of these, these units are really complex in and of themselves. This one may have more suitability for horizontal levees to protect the communities in a pretty squeezed area with very important marshes that may give longer life to those marshes um, in conjunction with some of the subtitle measures like eelgrass um, and mudflats. And then in this area, on the land side, there are certain places that are vulnerable in the near term, so not intensifying development in those places, possibly doing rezoning possibly using building codes to help transition the built environment to be built at a higher elevation or for more, with more flood protection included. So we want to also stress that these measures don't stand alone. Rather, 
They combine or stack along a transect from the bay up to our cities, and that really depends on the setting and the timing. So for example, here's a hypothetical diagram showing the combination of submerged aquatic vegetation along with oysters and a coarse beach to create a living shoreline that would also protect a road. Another example, hypothetical, is combining mudflat augmentation and marsh restoration on the bay side with the creek reconnection to the baylands um, and allowing the marsh to migrate over time when it can. So these types of strategies, measures can be phased in what's called an adaptation pathway. So here's a graphic from the Bayland Goals Report demonstrating how different measures have to be planned and implemented over time as water levels change. So we hope this work can inform the ability of communities and planners, cities, counties to make those pathways, make those pathways towards adaptation. The final step in using the Adaptation Atlas is to bring people together. We've talked about this already somewhat, but we really want people to work together to envision a resilient future. And that is actually, we're, we're pleased to say that's actually happening right now. Um, we have found that the OLU scale really resonates with people as a way of thinking through where do you draw the, the lines around where do you do adaptation planning and what are some of the strategies that are available to you. Um, it is also a resource to assist environmental review and permitting by some of our regional agencies and partners. It can be uh, used as guidance for people who want to do shoreline projects, whether they're developers or park districts. And it is something that uh, regional planners and communities who are just thinking broadly about climate adaptation can use when thinking about how to prepare for sea level rise. Right now, some of the people that we know are using the Atlas include BCDC, who are using OLUs as a unit of analysis for a very important project they're doing called Adapting to Rising Tides, which is a county-scale vulnerability assessment that will cover all nine counties in the Bay Area. San Mateo and Marin counties are also using OLUs as a planning unit for bringing people together around creating scenarios for future shorelines, and there are also several cities who are using OLUs in their adaptation planning. So you can find out more report, more information on our website and access the report at the link at the top, sfei.org slash adaptation projects. We've also made some interactive maps to walk through the story more quickly than we just did, but in a different way and perhaps for a different audience. And you know, we want to end by saying that this is a first step. There are many things going on, and we need to continue to advance the science, fill data gaps, and test these measures. We need to continue to understand what nature-based strategies mean, what do they actually do, how long do they last, how much do they cost, and what are some of those policy tools, and what, that, what, what does that look like when put into application? Um, the data will be available for download and also an interactive map shortly, but that's another thing that we're working on to make this science this planning tool more accessible to people. Um, and, and you know, we continue to work with communities across the Bay to help apply and help translate this work. So thank you. Thank you all for your interest. Thanks for the work you all do to help make the Bay, to help make the coastline a better place for future generations. Thanks again to our generous funders. And please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or want to follow up.